been other supplies here in West Bend where we all said, when's the rain going to clear up? And then you can saw, see your breath. I mean, there's, this is the gods are with us today. Um, the nieces are being kind to us. Uh, thank you for coming here. We are always wondering when we put together some cultural learning type programs along with Sitnamai. Our organization truly, truly believes that Sitnamai is more than pub fries and uh, a tractor pull. And I'm not dissing either one of them uh, because both of us work very hard all year long to have that happen. But we also want to have those slices of history having to do with Norway and Norwegians in history because that's why we have a Sitnamai. That's why other communities don't. What is it that's unique about the immigrants that came to here? Well, they were Norwegian. And they brought their traditions and, of course, to mind. Our involvement with making the organization seven and a half years ago called History Alive Project is one day we came out of church, and I'll teach you a little Westby, teach you a little Westby lingo. We have two churches in town. You might wonder, two Lutheran churches are the same everything. One is dark colored, and the other one is quite light. One is referred to as the Chocolate Church. Now you know which one's the brown one. Block up, or up, we're going towards Baroqua is the, of course, what's the flip of that? The Vanilla Church, and of course it kind of has that creamy lemon stone for its color. Long story as to how come those churches are the same and what all happened, yep, some Norwegians couldn't agree. And uh, uh, it's interesting to learn that story, but that would be for well, another time. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that term. Um, at that time, that was kind of going on throughout the United States, but here in Westby. Uh, the original Coonberry Church is about a mile uh, south of here, and uh, part of the congregation was 50 families that did not believe in the ideas of the uh, predestination, so they left. And that's how the second church, the, the dark brown one, got built. AKA Chocolate. <laughs> Uh, number two, why in the world did the David with Amundsen, husband combo, retired, once a chemistry teacher, one taught in ninth grade science, what are we doing? Starting a history group, getting a 501c3 to have for a little some money def or donations that we had, and doing what we do today. We do it because we talked with two ninth graders eight years ago, and we were just joshing with them after church, and we said, What's this about the Sutton Mine play now? What's about the Sutton Mine stuff? What's in Norwegian play? Well, I don't know. We have a tractor pull and we have hub fries and my grandma makes left some. That was it. And not that we use that as the whole to represent all of kids in ninth grade. And we went home after church that day and we said, nope, that's enough. We are going to try and find two teachers up at the high school who allow us to come in as three volunteers. We'll put together a crash course on why you've got Sutton Mine here in Coon Valley, and in all sorts of woods of immigrant, the whole package, okay? Try and do that to 90 minutes with ninth graders. But it worked. We presented our idea to the school board. When they found out we were going to charge them a cent, they thought it was a wonderful idea. And uh, uh, what has it grown to? Now we teach all classes of freshmen every single month, five classes every month, each one of them being anywhere, anywhere between 87 and 90 minutes. And yeah, we're bragging because we worked hard to do this, because we've gotten a lot of flack in the community for doing it. And the, the uh, that's our crown jewel. And so I know that when kids go walking across that stage at graduation, that we will have told and helped kids understand why they can say the common and why there is the little troll hunt and all that kind of stuff, because we want to have them have that for the next day. History is not to be put in a box and put on the shelf. It is to be brought out, and as our mission statement says, when you 501c3, for those of you who are going to start an organization, you better come up with some bylaws and some board of directors, and it's a good idea to have a mission statement. In our states, and every one of those words means a lot to us. Our job and our mission is to do out-of-the-box experiences for people of all ages in the Westby area. And that, that phrase, out of the box, resonates. You nodded your head. It means the different stuff. We bring the person that's going to talk to us about the regions in the Civil War. The person prior to us talked to us about the whole rich, lovely, lovely story about the Kumta and the Nissa and all that stuff. So, and hopefully our kids will be, I hope our kids will hold that. And we do have kids that will come and talk to us. And I remember, I remember Sukhumai's two words. Did you know that? They didn't even know what the word sit and mind meant. And so 
we had a right audience, and we feel good for it. And sometimes, like tomorrow, sometimes there will be some kids that, I remembered Mrs. Donaldson, I remembered. We don't know what they remembered, but um, that makes us feel good inside. So there. So today, we have our treat, Civil War, Mr. Longstead. Please give a warm up. Uh, can everyone hear me if I don't use the microphone? It's all right? Okay. okay. So, um, so I'd like to start by thanking Dave and Ruth for inviting me down. And I don't know if there's any board members or my, but, but thank you for uh, for hosting me. And uh, so I'd like to start with, with a question and a question just before we get into this. So first of all, question, is there anyone here who's a descendant of a member of the 15th Wisconsin? One. Okay, I was going to say, I've actually uh, done this a few times and there are some descendants out there. There was talk at one time about creating a group of descendants of the 15th Wisconsin. Is that... I don't know. Know. I was at the reunion in Eagle, Wisconsin when they did the presentation of the 15th Institute flag. Okay. And that's the last that I've okay. heard All right. about that. Okay. Um, so the second thing is is a, is a, a caution. So we're going to we're going to delve into history, and I can say with 100% certainty that there is no way that we can look at what happened 150 years ago without looking through it through the eyes that we have today. Meaning that the, the, there's impossible for us to fathom what they thought, what they did, why they did it, without putting our own values to it. And I will give you as an example, um, power to flight, for instance. If you had said something to any one of these young men back in the day about power to flight, you would have been told either it's sheer folly or, or even to the point where it's a sin against the laws of nature to even attempt to fly. Now, all this many years later, all of us would get on an airplane and fly somewhere without thinking twice about it. So, so that being said, what I'm going to try to do is explain what they went through um, and, and the appreciation for what they went through. As best we can understand it, um, I, would, I would use the words of Abraham Lincoln. Um, you may have heard him or may have heard him, have him saying, um, we do what is right by what God gives us to see the right. Basically, we're going to do the best we can knowing what we know to uh, learn about the 15th Wisconsin. So, that being said, let's go ahead and, uh, and get started here. So, before the Civil War, uh, 1850s, we had growing tensions already in the country. The country wasn't even 100 years old yet. Uh, a lot of the West was, uh, if not unexplored, it was uninhabited. There was the movement West, and there was a difference in culture from north to south. So as we're expanding, of course, the, the, the south was an agrarian-based, uh, you know, agriculturally-based society where, um, as appalling as we would find it, slavery was considered a normal, everyday thing. Um, again, that 150 years of, of history. Um, as, as we're growing here, the, the country's growing, but tensions are growing. Uh, John Brown, you've all heard of him, you know, he leads a raid where he's going to, um, he, he was a vehement anti-slave person, <coughs> he needed a slave uprising that, that did not work, it added to more tensions. Finally, President Lincoln is elected. Um, basically, the Democratic Party split between the North and the South. Lincoln would Barely 40% of the vote was by far the largest vote getter and won the presidency, even though way less than half the people wanted him to be president. When that happened, that set off a chain of events, and of course, we had states starting to secede from the Union. Um, Lincoln did his best to try to corral this back. He did not want a war, but he tried. But um, things get out of hand. Fort Sumter is bombarded and uh, four more states secede from the Union and Lincoln is forced to call for volunteers to put down this uprising. He calls for 75,000 volunteers. So these units come from all over. So how are Civil War units right now? Today if you, if you join the Army, you go to the recruiting office, you join the Army and they put you in somewhere. That's not how it was during the Civil War. So you had um, units raised in an area. 
uh, second Wisconsin, 24th Michigan, 15th Wisconsin. Um, you had professions, uh, firemen from from, Pennsylvania, from New York, coal miners from Pennsylvania joined as a group. You had a school, uh, the University of Grays and their tragic history from Mississippi, a bunch of college kids that came together and formed a regiment. And you had your ethnic groups, um, and I guess this is where the 15th you believe, but you had the Irish, you had the German, you had the Scottish Highlander. We've all seen the movie Glory, I think, in the 54th Massachusetts, the African American Regiment, and the 15th Wisconsin. Uh, I would say Norwegians are, are pretty lucky because the only Norwegian regiment was in the north, so we did not have a case of Norwegians fighting Norwegians. Um, and I'll, I'll segue off just a little bit here to the Irish region. Um, there was a large Irish population in the south also. Um, at, the, uh, at Mari's Heights at the Battle of Fredericksburg, there was an Irish unit in the Confederate Army staked on top of the hill behind a stone wall. And of course, the brigades flew flags that were remnant or you know, indicated their, their heritage. So the Irish brigades all had a green Irish, a green brigade flag. So you could see from 500 yards away that that's an Irish brigade. And they would often put a sprig of uh, of uh, clover in their hats to symbolize that they were from Ireland. So during the Battle of Fredericksburg, as these wave after wave of, of Union attacks are going up the hill at this entrenched enemy and are being mowed down, at one point an Irish brigade starts coming up the hill. Now, Irishmen are on top of the hill, and if you can picture this, grown men who are just loading and firing, with tears coming down their eyes, hollering, Go back, go back, and yet firing and, and completely decimating a regiment of who, men who five years ago were probably neighbors of theirs in Ireland. Um, so the Norwegian regiment luckily did not have a situation like that. They ever had to see another Norwegian regiment. So um, just one of those odd, odd things about the Civil War. So flags of the regiment. So. The national colors of the of the regiment. Now you can see the field of stars has been replaced uh, with the the, the model for God and Land. And the uh, 15th Wisconsin Regiment um, regimental flags were traditionally blue, unless of course you were Irish Brigade. But this was presented to them from the state of Wisconsin. And the red, or excuse me, the state color, the regimental colors. This was actually presented by the uh, a group of ladies up in Chicago when they were going to battle. All right, so the companies, there's 10 companies in a regiment, and today we're going to deal mostly with Company E. That was the regiment that was raised around here in Bad Axe County, now Vernon County. Um, a few other counties. Um, now this was called 15th Wisconsin, but you can see there were some from uh, Chicago area. There were a group from Minnesota. Um, the regiment was raised in Wisconsin, therefore they are the 15th Wisconsin. And these are 90% Scandinavian uh, immigrants. So a few facts about this. Uh, like I said, it was mainly recruited in Wisconsin. Some from Illinois, some from Iowa, some from Minnesota. 90% of the men in this regiment were born in Norway, uh, including Colonel Egg, the, uh, the commander. 10% um, being Swedes and Danes, but Scandinavians nonetheless spoke a common language. Um, one officer was not Scandinavian, but he was married to a Norwegian woman and was fluent in Norwegian, so therefore he could talk to the troops. Norwegian was their language of choice in the regiment. And this is uh, this is Colonel Hegg, born in Norway, and uh, he uh, mustered in with the company, with the regiment in, at Camp Randall in January of 62. By one account, 128 of the 906 men in the regiment would have answered if you just said, hey, holy. So uh, we kind of know they were a Scandinavian, uh, Scandinavian group. All right, so some of the things that uh, Holy would have carried with him, he had his uh, rifle and his bayonet. He had his uh, cartridge box, which would have carried all of his uh, cartridges. Canteen, very important. Uh, want to keep some water. A cap pouch, 
which enabled you to actually fire your rifle. Your haversack, which for the infantryman was everything. Uh, you carried extra food, you carried extra rounds of ammunition, you carried your uh, writing paper to write letters home, you carried your toothbrush, you carried your uh, sewing kit, whatever, everything was in your haversack. Maybe some money if you had it. Um, cartridges came in boxes of packages of 10. And hardtack. Um, and I have some hardtack that I will let you sample. Um, it is some, it'll keep you alive, let me tell you that. It'll keep you from starving. That is the, that is the best I can say about hardtack. Excuse me, Dave, did you bring your own batch of hardtack? I have a piece of hardtack. Well, there's a new baker in town, too, the History Alive Project. We tried making hardtack in our kitchen. I provide a recipe for you, low budget. And um, if you wish to try his, and we'll have, we'll have a hardtack uh, contest, see who's you like better, okay? <laughs> but I'll be interested in trying some of yours. Okay, so um, he's got some funny background colors too, but we'll just talk quickly. So this is, this is private Oli, and we're gonna talk about uh, how he would work in. So uh, one private Oli, and you put 12 of those together and you get a squad. I think the Army's kind of set up the same way today. Um, you take two squads, and you get a platoon. And you take uh, two platoons, and you get a company of 100 men at full strength. Regiments were very rarely at, at full strength once they got in the field. Um, excuse me, this is probably our platoon here. And this is our company with an officer. So you have 100 men plus an officer. And uh, that would be your, your company. And then 10 companies would make up a regiment. So these 10 companies would be make up a regiment. So at full strength on paper, a regiment had 1,000 men. Um, rarely did a company have or a regiment have 1,000 men. But these 10 companies would make up the 15 Wisconsin. Okay, Camp Randall today, everybody's been there, you've all seen the Badgers play football there, um, and that's fine. In 1862, Camp Randall didn't look like that, it was literally a military camp, and it is the birthplace of the 15th Wisconsin. So, it was established before the war in honor of uh, Governor Randall, who was only governor for three years before the war, so I don't know, he must have been a fantastic governor, <laughs> only three years, to have a camp named after him like that. Um, 15th Wisconsin was mustered in there along with, with many other regiments. 70,000 men trained at Camp Randall you know, in preparation for the war. Uh, it was later expanded to hold a military hospital and a prisoner of war camp, which uh, the 15th Wisconsin actually supplied uh, some of the prisoners to, uh, to go there. So it was purchased after the war, needed to Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin, and the stadium was built in 1917 and the Badgers have been playing football there ever since. So, where did the 15th City action? Um, they fought in the Western Theater, which gets confusing because they were at the Battle of Atlanta, which doesn't seem right, but that's considered the Western Theater. But they fought along the Mississippi. They fought uh, in the, um, I know you probably haven't heard of this, it's a very small battle, the Battle of Island Number 10 in Tennessee. Um, Perryville in Kentucky, again, considered the Western Theater, but you have to remember at the time, the states only went <coughs> to the Mississippi, so it was the Western Theater. Uh, Stones River, also in Tennessee. The Tullahoma campaign, and we'll talk about, about this one in a little bit more detail. Uh, Chickamauga, and anybody who knows anything about the 15th knows about Chickamauga. Uh, Rizaka, down in Georgia. Peach Tree in Georgia, which is just outside of Atlanta, and then the Battle of Atlanta, which is actually a, a month-long campaign, it's not a battle. Uh, Jonesboro, and then much further enough. So, they left Madison, traveled through Illinois to island number 10, and this island was on the Mississippi, and let's see, we'll just uh, talk about some things here. So, it was a position in the middle of the river, uh, occupied by the Confederacy early on in the war and very difficult to navigate by the river. The river makes a bend there, so ships had to slow down a lot to make the corner, and when they did, 
they were in line with the guns, they ought to be able to get guns on them. So it was a very, very strong position. Um, they did. It had an innate weakness. It, it was only supplied by one road. Uh, the Confederate, the Union soldiers were actually able to go around the river and on land they got behind the fort, cut off their supplies, and of course then to surrender. Not a huge battle. Uh, you can see the losses were, were pretty small, but you see 7,000 captured Confederates were sent north to um, Camp Randall. But significantly, we're almost a year into the war when this happens, and it's the very first position along the entire Mississippi that the Confederacy has lost. And that was part of the grand plan of the Union was to gain back control of the Mississippi so, as Lincoln said, it could roll unvexed to the sea. So, um, a momentous occasion there that they were able to do that. Now, three weeks later, New Orleans fell, and now, just like that, the Confederacy is in danger of being split into Vicksburg is the last real big nut that needs to be cracked. So, now moving inland, they move on to the Battle of Perryville, also known as Chaplin Hills. And uh, this is uh, a campaign more than a battle. And uh, at the end of it, Braxton Bragg um, ends up having to move out of Kentucky. There, it's out of, uh, it's out of Kentucky. And the Union takes over Kentucky and never loses control of Kentucky for the rest of the war. Met Kentucky was a, a border state. They never actually joined the Confederacy, but there was always concern they would. After this, that was never really on the table. They weren't going to join the Confederacy. Um, it was the largest battle fought in Kentucky. And 20% casualties, so it is a, a pretty bloody battle as that goes. So one out of five men involved were, were wounded or killed in the battle. So, Stones River, Tennessee. Um, second battle in Murfreesboro. President Lincoln, um, so this was just after the Battle of Fredericksburg, and he really, really needed something to go right. I mean, the war's going bad, the papers are, are you know, it, there's already this growing sentiment that, that this war that everybody thought was going to be over in a month is now going way longer, it's way bloodier, it's way costlier, and it's already rumblings that like, maybe we should just quit. And Lincoln really needs something to go right. So, he gets it here. Um, both commanders tried to, where they, they were set up to attack each other, and, and kind of like a swinging gate, they both attacked each other's right. Um, both had some initial success, and uh, finally the uh, Confederate assault was, was beaten back again. Tremendous casualties, and this 31.4% of men involved in this battle were, were um, wounded or killed, and it does make it percentage-wise the bloodiest battle of the war. Um, but again, a, a Union victory and the Confederates are forced to retreat. Um, that was followed by the Tullahoma campaign. Now this is a campaign that, that General Rosecrans put together and he did this, it's, it's considered still one of the most brilliant maneuvers during the war. Um, and, and the Norwegian regiment was a key part of this and they basically drove the Confederates out of Tennessee without ever having fought a major battle. They were able to outmaneuver them, um, and uh, they, they, they kept one step ahead of the Confederates, which is, is an odd thing because you think of General Lee and General um, Stonewall Jackson always being one step ahead. But Rosecrans did a magnificent job without putting his army in harm's way, and was able to push the Confederates out of uh, Tennessee. It happened the same week, though, as Gettysburg and the Battle of Vicksburg fell. Rosecrans always felt that he didn't get the credit he deserved for this, and that's probably true because his feet pale in comparison to Gettysburg and, and Vicksburg. Um, the problem is that, yes, he saved his own army, but he also did not do any damage to the Confederate army, and that would come back and haunt him at a place called Chickamauga. So the Battle of Chickamauga uh, is a three-day affair. It ended the uh, Southern uh, the Union advance. First battle fought in Georgia. Um, second highest number of casualties right behind Gettysburg. And uh, 
Rosecrans renews his, his offensive. Uh, General Bragg, though, the Confederate general, is, is he's retreated and retreated and retreated, and now he's got a chance to hit the Union Army while they're traveling and, and get them in pieces. And so he does, he heads north, and uh, fighting begins in earnest with his attack on Rosecrans. So, we don't have any good pictures, but we do have paintings. So late in the afternoon of the 19th, um, several attacks were mounted. A Colonel Head, the general, the, the colonel who put together the 15th, who personally funded it, who recruited it, um, was, was mortally wounded at uh, Chickamauga. His second in command, Ole Johnson, was uh, captured and his third in command was shot three times, survived, but uh, so, so the, the, the leadership of the regiment was, was, was taken out in that battle. Um, and we were, yes, we were talking about, the, this is the plaque from the uh, um, memorial that the 15th put up at, uh, at, at Chickamauga. So the next day, Bragg resumed his attack uh, Rosecrans at one point in the day got some misinformation that he had a gap in his line. He didn't have a gap in his line, but he sent word to move someone to fill that gap. When they moved, as fate would have it, they moved right out of the way of an eight division attack by the Confederates, which basically split the army in two and sent them scrambling back north. The, the, the battle was uh, pretty much over at that time. Um, Rosecrans himself left the field of battle in panic, and uh, they were able to put together a rear guard to save the army, but the resulting retreat, um, they ended up all the way back up in the, Chicken, or in the Chattanooga and bottled up inside the city uh, with no way of feeding themselves or getting out, and uh, General Grant actually came to their, to their rescue. Uh, Colonel Haig, this is a famous painting or a famous picture of the death of Colonel Haig at Chickamauga. There is some debate as to whether or not he was actually on a horse when he died. But this was a big story in Norway. Um, the 15th Wisconsin was followed extensively by the Norwegian press. Their stories were sent back to Norway. They were printed up in papers. They were uh, um, There was a lot of interest in Norway. Um, I don't know so much about the war, but the 15th Wisconsin. And this news traveled all the way back to Norway. Uh, I, I, I'm sure a lot of people, since 80, 90% of these men came from Norway, there were a lot of families in Norway that knew a lot of these young men. So after Chickamauga, uh, the Battle of Rizaka, they, they, uh, they did get out of uh, Chattanooga and moved back down into Georgia. So this marked the first battle that the 15th went into without uh, Colonel Haig. Um, Colonel Wilson returned from his multiple wounds and was actually in command of the regiment. And uh, the, union, the, the Union's power of numbers is starting to take over at this point. They can put much bigger armies in the field, so they outnumber the, the Confederates wherever they see them. And uh, now, despite that numerical advantage, they do have some problems here, um, except uh, William T. Sherman, one of the new generals that Lincoln likes a lot. He's aggressive. He, he's always on the offensive. He's able to get across a river with some pontoon bridges and, and, and turn the tide of, of the battle. Uh, the battle was considered inconclusive, but the uh, Confederates were forced to retreat. They burned some bridges, but Union engineers come built them as fast as they could burn. So that gets us down into, uh, into just outside of Georgia. John Bell Hood now has been given command of the army. John, Sidney Johnston has been fired. And John Bell Hood says, well, you know, Sidney's plan was really the best plan, so he goes with it. Um, so they retreat across the river. They set up as best they can defenses. And the Confederate is, the army is in no shape anymore to mount any kind of offensive attacks. Um, basically, at this point in the war, their strategy is to hold out and make it as painful as possible and hope that the North just gives up and says, okay, fine, we'll, we'll just call it a draw. 
or that they would get some recognition from Europe, which France and Germany or France and England would not give them. So um, Hood tries one more attack. He's under pressure from, from the government, his government. He tries one more attack. It, it doesn't work, and they have to fall back into um, Atlanta. So interesting, our man Ole, who had been captured at Chickamauga, escaped from Libby prison with two other men and walked for more than a month from Virginia to rejoin the regiment. And he was placed in command four days after the battle because now he was the senior, the senior officer. So uh, a month long walk to get back in the fight seems like uh, a pretty extraordinary measure to me. Um, and walking through hostile territory where um, you know, if you didn't speak with a southern draw, you can give yourself away pretty quickly. Um, had to steal clothing, obviously, because you couldn't travel through the countryside dressed as a Union colonel. So uh, quite, a, quite a, a journey for him and his two comrades. Uh, battle of Atlanta, and again, it's not a battle, it's more of a campaign. And Atlanta was the rail center of the South, and basically you can say that the railway here would have spread all the way over here. If you take Atlanta, anything from down here can't get up here. So it was a, a, a huge, a huge uh, target, a huge prize for the Union forces to have. Um, that being said, sieges are hard, and it took a while, it took a month. Um, and though it's considered a Union victory, initially it wasn't so much a victory. The Confederates pulled back into town and, and tightened themselves up even tighter. Sherman realized, okay, I can't win this. I have to settle in for a siege. And we've all seen the movie Gone with the Wind, you know, Atlanta burning. Um, a lot of that was Confederates leaving, setting things on fire. And the Union troops, uh, really at this point in the war, saying, if it's already on fire, let's just let it burn. So they were, uh, they were, they were not in the mood to be helpful. Um, so this actually occurred halfway through the campaign, though. So Atlanta fell, but because the Confederate Army was still in the field. Um, interesting thing about the Civil War, at the beginning of the war, um, the whole idea was you have to take the capital. That was, that was, it was on to Richmond, on to Richmond. That's where wars were fought back then. You occupied cities. The Civil War, and, and our army works this way today, it changed the way of thinking where Instead of occupying capitals or occupying areas, the goal of the war now is to destroy the enemy's ability to fight. So taking Atlanta, taking Vicksburg, taking Richmond doesn't win you the war. You still have to go out and you have to meet the enemy's army and take away their ability to fight. Um, it took the Union a while to get that through their minds. Um, but again, that's that's what they teach at West Point now. That is that is the, the you you go to the enemy now. Um, so this is interesting. This is the Ponder House, and this is outside of Atlanta. This was used by Confederate sharpshooters, and uh, you can see that they had a pretty good spot until some Union artillery was brought in, and that kind of took away their ability to do these sniping. Um, this plantation, I believe, had 76 slaves at the time. One of the sons of the slave, a slave who worked here, became the first African American to graduate from West Point. That, to me, is a a monumental step. That is a um, to, to to go from being enslaved, probably not being allowed to read or write, and your son graduates from West Point. Um, that that's a a watershed moment. So this is another view. This is the line of defenses, and you can see in the back here the Ponder House. Now you look at the wood structures, and they are stripped of all the wood, including the, the porch on the Ponder House. And you can see where that wood has gone. It has all gone into the defensive lines. So, and they would have done the same thing to the house, except it was made out of brick. So that's why that's why it stood. Um, this house was never rebuilt after the war. The plantation was a peach plantation that went out of business, and it, it was never um, it never produced crops again after the war. 
So Jonesboro, this is the last battle that the 15th Wisconsin fought in. It was part of the Atlanta campaign. And uh, um, Sherman being aggressive, and he, he's, he's a good general. He's able to uh, maneuver himself around, and um, he takes Atlanta and is occupied by Union troops for the remainder of the war. The noteworthy thing about the fall of Atlanta, even up to this point in early 1864, the Union was really getting war weary, and General McClellan, the former General McClellan, was actually running on the Democratic ticket, and their platform was peace now. If he won the presidency, the war was going to be over, and the Confederacy was going to be their own country, and they were going to call it a draw. Um, and, and Lincoln had a lot of worries that that was actually going to happen. He needed something still good to happen. When Atlanta fell, it was like the whole country took a deep breath and they realized, okay, it's not over, but we can see the end now. Let's see it through. Lincoln won the presidency by a landslide, which was basically the last hope that the Confederacy had of of prolonging things. They were out of men, they were out of material, they were out of food. The blockade was, was tightening on a daily basis. They weren't going to get recognition from France and, and Great Britain. Um, they could have just surrendered the day after the election. They did not. They kept going for almost another year. But um, so, uh, it, like I said, it got Lincoln reelected, and it was basically a referendum on the war. 15th, 15th Wisconsin began mustering out of service. They had put in their three years by this point, so they began mustering out in Georgia um, right after this battle. So they did not participate in Sherman's march, at least not as armed combatants, and they did not participate when Sherman's army went up the coast and, and moved into South Carolina. They were out of the army at that point. So the 15th Wisconsin, of course, came from all over Wisconsin, Illinois, but, but today I want to talk about the soldiers that came from Ben Badax and Alberta County. The original roster was 14 soldiers, and uh, seven of those 14 died while in service, um, and one was discharged due to a disability. So here's just a quick, um, and I, some of these names may still be familiar around here. Um, now the black the black band on the corner means that this soldier uh, died. A red one you will see. So this is a soldier that was uh, born in Norway and unmarried when he enlisted, and uh, he was actually captured and taken and he died at Libby Prison, date unknown. Uh, and we'll go through this kind of quick. Uh, Lawrence Arneson um, lived uh, in Hamburg. That's uh, you, I'm sure know where Hamburg is. He was wounded, um, went to a hospital, he was sick, went to a hospital, he was missing after a battle, he had been captured and taken to Atlanta where he died, and he is buried in, in Georgia. Uh, Peter Erickson, uh, again, um, age 22, unmarried. He was captured um, in Georgia and taken to Libby Prison where he also died and he is buried in, uh, in the Richmond National Cemetery. Uh, Torber Erickson, um, this guy, this gentleman, actually lived through the battle, he lived through the war, he came back and he worked in um, in this area, filed for his pension, and he died in 1907. And uh, so he may have some uh, relatives around here. Uh, this gentleman, moved to uh, South Dakota and, and, and died there in 1882. This gentleman, I believe he actually uh, enlisted with his uh, sons and, and a brother, uh, but he died in, the, uh, in Chattanooga. He was uh, sick and uh, sickness was a, was a huge, huge problem. Actually, more men died of sickness than bullets during the Civil War. And uh, especially the country guys who weren't used to being around other people, who diseases seemed to get them, and they didn't grow up having a cold and having this. So when they got something, it was, it was very bad. Anyway, so he, uh, 
he did not come home. Um, this gentleman's actually got a pretty extensive history here. He moved to uh, Illinois, Minnesota, married, um, has had a number of children, and his wife filed for a widow's pension in 1919, so he lived a long uh, life after this. Uh, died of a disease in Tennessee and is buried there. Uh, this gentleman came back and uh, he actually re-enlisted after the company was, was or after the regiment was, was mustered out. Uh, he enlisted in, a, in the artillery battery and moved to Dane County after the war. Uh, Again, a guy who came back, uh, lived in uh, Norway, Wisconsin, not far from here. Another gentleman who died in Kentucky, I think one of three that died there. Um, another gentleman that was captured and sent to a, uh, no, I'm sorry, another gentleman who got sick and died in Chattanooga. All right, here's our guy who, uh, he was discharged for a disability. Uh, the records don't say what that disability was. It could have been a wound, uh, could have been any number of things, could have been sickness. Uh, but he was discharged from the Army for a disability. Stocky, this is a name that's probably familiar, and he's actually buried in the Valley Lutheran Church Cemetery. So he's a... He's a local man through and through with an extensive family. So that name might, might ring a bell. So here's some of the uh, faces of the 15th. This is not just company E, but these are some of the pictures that you can find online. Um, all young Norwegian men who went off on this adventure, if you will, and uh, their lives were clearly changed forever. So of the 15th Wisconsin, eight, of, eight officers and 86 enlisted men Killed in action out of the 906. Um, so that's that's 94 men who died of wounds. 241 died of disease. So that's almost three times as many died of disease as died of, of actual battle wounds. They lost over 200 men to disability um, and 22 missing. So at the end of their three years, 320 of the original 906. So about a third came home after the war. So if you're interested in doing some more research on this, uh, we have, there's a really good website, the uh, NAGC NL um, has a fantastic array of information on all these guys, and that's at uh, wisconsinhistory.org. Um, all of these books are very good. Um, Colonel Hagen's voice is fantastic. It has some great letters written home. Um, one's very touching. Uh, uh, man writes home to tell his mother and father that his brother, their son, passed away. It's um, a tremendous letter and just the, the, the way they wrote back in the day and, and the faith that they had, it was just, uh, uh, it's, it's a really good read. I promise you'll enjoy it. So that's, uh, that's what I have. Um, again, this is Colonel Hake's monument at, uh, at Chickamauga and his statue at the uh, in Madison. So, that being said, thank you for your attention. Dave, and can you speak to that Colonel Hague statue and the demise it had a couple of years ago, and now it's been not beheaded but reheaded? <laughs> so, <laughs> tell us about that story. Maybe so, a couple about. of years ago, um, that statue was actually taken off this pedestal by a group of people who yeah. I, I, clearly. What they were angry about was not directed at Colonel Hay, but the statue was taken blocks away and thrown into Lake Mendota, I believe, is where it ended up going, and has been removed from the lake and put back in its proper place. Um, very ironic because Colonel Hay was, um, when he came from Norway, like the Germans and the Norwegians had a strong what's called a hatred of slavery. They felt it was wrong. Um, there's a story of a, there was an attempted slave auction held in St. Louis and a bunch of, a group of German women um, showed up and actually shut it down, which is um, 
you know, a bunch of people were there intent on making a lot of money, and a group of German women <coughs> put a stop to it, which I, I think is, like, again, that's a, it speaks volumes to the type of people that those people were, that, that not that they think it was wrong, but they went and did something about it. Uh, Colonel Haig was the same way. He, he was a, a, a wealthy, influential person. He put together the 15th by himself, I mean, if not by himself, but he recruited it. It was his idea. He he outfitted it, um, and that's how that's how much he felt about um, the slavery issue and and about keeping the country together. You have to remember now that 90 percent of these young men just gave up everything they owned and came across the ocean with their families or by themselves to this new country and. I, I think, and again, I can't say because this is 150 years ago, but, but they've staked everything to go to this new country, and now to think that this new country that they're now wanting to call home is in crisis and it could dissolve before their eyes was a huge motivator to why they would want to become involved in this. Um, because really, I mean, they just got off the boat. It's really not their fight. This was going on before they got here. They could have just gone to their farms in Wisconsin and Minnesota and and, and lived their life. And and yet they gave up everything to join. And, and I, I understand that whole adventure thing is part of the whole thing. But it's, it doesn't explain it all. I mean, there, there's got to be something else besides just wanting to go on an adventure. And I was think a lot of that was... Was this group paid at all? They were paid the standard army wage, thirteen dollars a month. Um, which you know that sounds like not a lot of money, but it was it was paid, um, and you got fed what it's worth. Um, they they got you know they got all the hard tack they could eat, um, but they uh, yes. So it's it's just like I say, it's a <coughs> testament. And I don't know that looking at it through today's eyes, we can fully understand all the motivations and all the things that would go into this. Clearly, life was different then, but it was harder. So um, there is a story about um, the first Wisconsin, or first Minnesota, how they were on a march one day, and they had marched, I want to say, 14 miles, which is a long way to walk, carrying everything you need. And it's getting toward the end of the day, and someone rides up and tells the guy at the head of the column, you missed the turnoff three miles back. So about face, march three miles back, and now take a left and march another four miles. So you've added another seven miles to your walk. So it's almost 20 miles that day. And you get there, and the wagons that are carrying your tent and the food, they're lost. So it's whatever you got in your haversack is now what you've got to eat. And then it starts to rain, like, like the skies open. And reading this letter that one of the first Minnesota guys wrote home, he talks about he and his brother actually slept that night. They sat as, in as dry a plot spot as they could, uh, leaned up against each other so that they wouldn't have to sleep in the mud. Now, I don't know about you, but my morale was pretty shot this morning. And I think the next morning, if you want me to go anywhere, it's not until you give me some breakfast and some hot coffee and some dry clothes. Otherwise, I'm, I'm just really not committed to this right now. And those guys got up the next morning and dried themselves off and realized, well, okay, food's not here. I guess we got to go to where the food is. I, I don't know. That's a, you know, we can't, we can't even comprehend that. Yeah. You mentioned before that uh, General Hank, um I don't know whether he furnished or supplied the stuff he, when he organized this. Um, where did he get his finances to be able to do that? Do you know, I, you know I, I, I don't, I don't know what he was as a business type person. I know he was he was influential in politics. Um, he he was a considered a, a wealthier man, and any fundraiser he he went around and, and he beat the bushes and he got people to donate. Of course, I mean the government supplied them the uniforms and, and things like that. But but the the fifteenth was. His impetus that got that going. Okay. So, yeah. I was at the County Museum yesterday, learning about Jeremiah Rusk, yeah. and how he formed a group of soldiers from this area, from mm -hmm. Oakland, 
and he became a general, I guess, in the Civil War. Uh, so was there any connection between these two units? Um, no, no. No, the 15th was um, basically, out of, I mean, he was from down near Madison. A lot of the officers came from Chicago. Um, but, but no, and, and this was, it was a Scandinavian regiment. These were, these were men who, if you had given a command in English, you might not have gotten much response from this group. You know, this, was, this was men from Scandinavia, Spoke Norwegian, who, uh, you know, it, it's just weird to think that they were transplanted into a, into a war completely outside their comfort zone. Yes. Do you want to tell about your uniform? Oh, I will, I will tell about my uniform, yes. So this is a standard uh, Union infantry uh, uniform. So, of course, I've got my canteen. It's extremely important that you got your canteen and you want to keep that as close as you can at all times. Um, my haversack with my, my coffee cup and in here, and I, I can show everyone wants to see this after. I got a dinner plate. I've got uh, a, a fork, a knife, and a, and a spoon. Um, I've got my uh, money in my tab. I've got my sewing kit. Um, so basically, you know, if I were uh, a loose, mold young man, I might have some dice in there or a uh, deck of cards. That sort of thing, which oftentimes when a soldier was going into battle, if he had come from a place where you know uh, very religious, which uh, you know a lot of these guys did, they might, um, as they're going into battle and they're hearing the gunshots going on, they might dig in their haversack and pull out their dice and their cards and say, "Hey, Joel, would you uh, give this back to me after the battle?" Uh, because they didn't want their body going home and their mother finding going through their stuff and finding home. Oh, Oh, my son was gambling and everything else. And uh, of course, now you're, you're also relying that, that Joe's also going to come back to the battle. Otherwise, you know, you're not getting your stuff back. So, uh, so there was a certain amount of stuff there. So anyway, uh, of course, I have my, my bayonet. Uh, these make for really good show pieces uh, because of the accuracy and the range of the rifles. Um, Rarely did people get within range to use a, a bayonet. Um, 20th man at the uh, long top was probably the exception to that because they ran out of ammunition and the enemy was that close. But um, these make a great thing. You stick them in the ground outside of your tent flap and you stick a candle in the hole and you can, uh, you can read by candlelight at night. Um, if you had some uh, dough or something, you could wrap that around here and you could hold that over the fire and you could cook yourself a little pretzel dough type of thing. Um, you stick this on top of your rifle and you get your two buddies and you can stack your rifle so they stay dry at night. You could, you could do all that kind of stuff. Otherwise, um, not, not really a, a helpful weapon and, and they're only sharp on the point, they're not sharp on the edge. So, and I have, uh, See, this, this is a not authentic, this is a recreation, but this is a 58 caliber uh, Enfield rifle. So this would have came from England. That's where they bought them all. But they did make a Springfield rifle, looks a lot like this, and I don't know what it is, like three ounces later. Right? They're, they're, the Springfield for whatever reason. But the Enfield was much more accurate, right? So, but if you carry this all day, Hey. It, it, it's, it's, it's At the really end of the day, it weighs about 150 pounds. Yeah, it, it, it gets heavier as the day goes on. Um, but a really solid, a really solid weapon to take a lot of abuse. Now, what made these so, what changed the, the, the way the war was fought, this actually has, people call this a musket, technically it's a rifle. It has a rifle barrel. So when a bullet comes out of it, it spins, and you know when you throw a football and it spins, it's, it goes straighter. So the range of the old smooth bores was 75 to 100 yards for a good shot. This bumped it up to about five, 600 yards that a guy could hit pretty consistently. So you can see, um, that's I, I can now shoot accurately way farther. So again, it takes the bayonet out of the whole equation. Plus. Um, the, the tactics didn't change as fast as the weaponry, so the massive assaults were, were, were 
suicidal to go up against people with a weapon like this. So, um, to load this weapon, you would now, we're all undone here, this is all cleaned out, in fact there's even a cap in it. So if you were going to load this, you would have to reach into your pouch, pull out a cartridge, this pouch, pull out a cartridge. Um, the physical requirements for a soldier in the Civil War, you had to have at least three teeth on the top over here and three teeth on the bottom over here so that you could fight off, the, because you had to fight the paper off, squeeze the powder down in it and put the ball, and you needed these two fingers on, on your shooting hand so that you could do that and do that. That's what you, uh, that was the requirement. So, like I say, you would bite this off, you would put this down there, you would then have to run that down there, get that nice and seated. And then you'd have to reach into your cat pouch and cat pouch here. They wouldn't be shooting at you while you're doing this, would they? Yeah, they, they would. They would. So, so you get your cap and you put that on there on, on your that And the cap is just a little brass cap with a little bit of uh, igniter on it. And after all that, then you would aim and fire. A good soldier could do that three times in a minute. Um, now, I've, I've, I've done it. I've done three shots in a minute. No one's been shooting at me while I've been doing that, so my hand, I, I just can't imagine, especially the first couple of times, if you were trying to do this and trying to get everything done without spilling your powder. Or without, shaking, too. Yes, I, I it just, I, I don't Plus know how the noise, you, the, the din of all of this? Yes, yes. And, and in the yes, confusion, yes. I mean, they, they, found, they found rifles at Gettysburg like that had six or seven rounds in them where a guy was too nervous to realize that he wasn't firing and he was just loading and he was probably he was probably nervous enough that he wasn't putting a cap on here so he was probably pulling it back and firing and nothing was happening but in the noise and everything else he was you know um, so he's just sticking rounds in there and not firing um, so yes it's a so again if anybody wants to see this afterward and, and just carry this thing it's yeah. It's, like a lot of work. it's a it's a monstrous uh, thing that gets heavier heavier as you go. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the ammunition because you mentioned they they had these boxes of it, but those were those little they're like Tootsie Roll. Yes. Right. Yes. I got I've got a couple of years. The whole thing is like, just powder. And you just rip the end. Yep. You pour the powder because in. Because before that they used to use like a horn. Yeah. And this was a lot easier, and it's measured. Measure, and your powder stayed dry, and, and yeah, it's still messy, it's black powder. It's not as easy as a real card. It's not, no, no it's not. Um, so, the barrels get really hot really quick. I mean, I've been in reenactments where we get fired 10 or 12 shots back to back to back, and, and it gets to a point where you can't, Touch things, you know. Okay. So were they using the ball? Or yes. Were they using? Uh, they have a mini wall, and I have one. If anyone wants to see that. Okay. They, they weren't shut. use. They weren't using the the long. No, no. Okay. It's a it's a, well, it's a it's a cone shaped bullet, but it's kind of a hollow deal. If anyone wants to see the whole science behind it, I'd be happy to show you afterward. But um, yeah, so that is that is what the infantryman carried everywhere he went, and. Um, that's what I've got on. And of course the canteen. So I always like to ask this question, and I, if you know the answer, don't shout it out right away, but I like to hear what kind of answers I get. So I have heard that Norwegians have the highest rate of reporting for morning roll call. Yeah, every morning, every company did a roll call. Norwegians had the highest rate of being present for duty. And there's a theory for that. Does anybody have a theory as to why Norwegians would be more apt to show up for roll call than other nationalities? They wanted coffee? <laughs> that's that's yeah. very close. So here's, I'll just cut to the chase. Norwegians like their coffee. 
and also being men of expediency, so what they would do is, he, people didn't understand germs back in the day, so when they got to a camp, someone would have to go to the river, and there might be cows standing 100 yards upstream in that river. Um, some units would just go out and fill up their canteens, not thinking anything of it, um, and then that's what they're drinking all day. So a lot of times what Norwegian regiments would do is or the, they would set up, somebody would go get the water and they'd pour it in a big pot and let's boil that water and make some coffee right away. Okay, so they boil that water, make coffee, and when they're all done, there's still water in there because we didn't use it all. So now instead of going all the way back down the stream to fill my canteen, I'm just going to dip right out of there. So without realizing it, they were drinking purified water. So. Um, that's, that's the theory that I have been told. I, I don't know. Um, I know Germans like coffee. I know uh, I everybody really likes coffee, right? So, but but that's that's the theory was that it was an expedient thing because was, and, and without knowing it, they they drank clean water. So there's another thing. Norwegians oftentimes don't need as much sleep as other people. I mean, I think of some of the Norwegians I know of that survived on four or five hours of sleep. And there are others of us who, you know, need our seven or eight. <clears throat> so they probably were up early. Well, you're, you're sleeping on a patch of ground, if you're lucky, under a tent. It isn't like sleeping in a nice bed where you could just lay there for another hour. You, when you start to wake up and if there's noise going on, it is a tent, you're, you're probably awake. So yeah, there's probably something to that. Plus, like I say, it's a different, a different time, a different lifestyle that, that we can't even fully comprehend as and, to. And also think of the ground and how cold it would be too in the morning when you wake up. Cold or, or, or it's, it's funny, the, the, during the, 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 the war, before the war, people in the north, I've, I've read this, had an idea that people in the south were inherently lazy because they didn't do a lot of, well, they didn't do their own work if they had slaves, but they didn't work during the day, and they took it slow. And people in the South felt like Northerners were just too greedy, they're working all the time, and then during the war, so of course the, the Union soldiers are down South and they realize that you know, it is hot and humid. Boy, the noon time is no time to be out doing anything down here. Boy, if I lived down here, I'd work at night, you know? And then the, 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 the southern troops that went north as prisoners realized that, boy, it's cold up here. You kind of have to be doing something all the time to keep yourself moving. Plus, you know, it's not just about bringing in the crops. You've got to still put away some wood for the winter and everything else. So they kind of realized why the other one was, was like they were. It's not that they were inherently lazy or inherently greedy. It's because that's where they lived and that's kind of the lifestyle you had to live. So. Can you speak to the buttons on your uh, uniform? True or false? The different reg what, what grouping of people had uh, buttons with, what's the word I want? Not etchings. What's the word? Uh, Stamp? So that we know where you're from. Well, so these are just, this is a standard, a federally issued uniform. So these are um, eagles on my buttons. Now, if you were from the South, where they were more about the states, okay, your, buttons, right. your buttons may have uh, um, a, a B for Virginia, or a C for South Carolina. Okay. Because that was, you know, they were all about, yeah, we are the Confederacy, but I'm Virginia Confederacy, or I'm South Carolina Confederacy, I'm Alabama Confederacy. So they were all about the whole states', the whole right. states rights things. In fact, there's a famous quote where they were putting together um, Arlington Cemetery, and they were burying the, the, the first people in Arlington Cemetery were, were Union veterans of, of, of the Civil War, and someone asked the general who was in charge if he should be sorting the bodies by state, and the general made the comment, "To hell with states' rights, mix them up." So, so that's why Union soldiers in Arlington Cemetery are not grouped by states. He, he had enough of the whole states' rights things. And, and that was 
that was that. Yeah. So, if a guy in a foxhole with you, you don't care what state he's from, right? Right. And, and, and there's been enough trouble already caused by states' rights, and yeah, yeah we're just going to mix them up. Really? Even today? Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, thank so, you very much. Yes. Huge. Welcome back to Sid and Mai. We just uh, had an interesting conversation, uh, kind of a show and tell a little bit here with Dave Glomstead. And uh, Dave, thanks again for taking the time out. What a wonderful presentation. And, and where do you come up with all this stuff? A lot of research. Um, a lot of research, but uh, I loved history since I was a, a, a young man. Um, so it's, it's been more of a labor of love than anything else. Uh, it's, just being a history guy, listening to his parents' stories and things, um, but that's that's where it's come from. I just wow. really love history. When did you uh, first start like collecting everything and then realizing that you got a little bit of a gift here to go and talk to folks so, about this? So I started. Um, I, I became aware of the uh, a local reenacting group that was reenacting uh, Company B of the Second Wisconsin Part of the Iron Brigade, and I remember going to meet those guys for the first time and finding out that the, the mayor of La Crosse had actually been killed the day before the Battle of Antietam and thinking, they never told me that in school. Why, <laughs> how, how am I just finding about this now? And, and, and I got involved in that and, and digging into the local history, which there is surprisingly a lot of when it came to the Civil War, yeah. and you know, got the uniform. And, and uh, there, there's really a, a, a market, if you will, for doing talks like this, people uh -huh. want to know. Uh, I've done schools, I've done 
lodges. I've done civic events like this. There is a lot of interest in it, and and people are always surprised that it's all true local history. Wow. Yeah. It, it's just it's amazing with that. I I loved history when I was growing up. Kind of for whatever reason steered away from it, but it's intriguing to see stuff like this, and and, uh, and it's it's very unique. One of the things we were talking about as we were coming up here, uh, you have gone and done some of the Civil War reenactments. How, how many have you done? Um, I've, I've done oh, a dozen or so, and it is a, I remember the, the first one I did, it was, um, it was really an eye opener because you can read all you want in the book, but boy, you know, when you've got the stuff on and it's hot and it's uncomfortable and the wool is chafing and the rifle's heavy, yeah. and then you're out on the field and, and there's opponents out there. I mean, I, I, I understood it was all fair, it was play acting, Yeah. but I know the, the first reenactment I was in, I mean, my hands were shaking and, and, and it was, it, it's just unnatural to, it was just a, a real eye-opening thing that you could never get out of reading yeah. a, a book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it just really gave you that first person sense of, wow, this is, this is what it was like. Did you survive all of them? Um, no, I, I, <laughs> I was a casualty. I actually had my hand cut off uh, at the Battle of Pea Ridge. Oh wow! Um, yeah, it was uh, it was quite an experience. Yeah. So explain that a little bit. What happened? Um, so the Battle of Pea Ridge, the reenactment they do down in uh, Iowa at Keokuk, and there's actually a, a man who portrays a surgeon. And after the battle, I was laying on the field, and I remember two young men coming along, and I, I got chosen because because they said this one looks light. I think we can carry him. <laughs> so I was the one that got thrown on the stretcher and taken back and put on the table and a doctor leaned across me and said, we're going to cut off your hand, scream a lot. So he got out a saw and, he, and when he was all done, he had a rubber hand with a couple fingers missing that he pulled out of a pocket oh and he my. threw over his shoulder, a lot of gasps, and then I made a fist. He wrapped it all up in a red bandage and put some white around it and when I got off the table, I had a bloody stump. Oh my and goodness. It was, it was quite, a, quite an experience. <laughs> So well, and, and thank goodness it was play acting, it, right? It, it was, but again, it gave you the whole feel of uh, you know someone on my chest holding me yeah. down as they're cutting, and yeah. it was a yeah, um, yeah, it was a eye-opening experience. <laughs> Just, I would, I, I'm glad it was you. <laughs> so, uh, uh, congratulations! Uh, you are uh, less than a month, or about a month away from retiring. That's, I heard that's our plan. Yep. Yeah. So, congratulations on that. Uh, once you retire, I imagine you're going to be kept busy with a lot of this stuff and maybe, um, I, maybe more. Yes, I, um, in fact, just today I, I made some more contacts who would like to, yep. me to come and talk. Yep. And, uh, yeah. uh, and, and and again, the fact that it's it's true and it's local history. This yeah. is not something that happened yeah. to someone in Virginia or New York right. or whatever. This is, in this case, you know, Vernon County. Yeah, um, I, I like that when you said you know bad acts, which is now Vernon County, and, mm -hmm. and I thought how unique. You wouldn't even realize that sometimes. Times. No, no, so, you wouldn't. Yeah. But uh, yes, all the all the official roles list all the soldiers as being from Bad Axe County. Wow, wow. Yeah. Well, Dave, thank you so much for taking the time out here where we can chat after your presentation. Uh, great job down there, and uh, wealth that wealth of information. I think people will be maybe even a little more proud of Vernon County now. All right. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> All right. Dave Glomstead All here. Right. Thanks so much. And uh, we appreciate his time. And I imagine we'll see him somewhere around the, again. Who knows? Uh, you got all these contacts coming yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be back with more here of the Westby Sitting to My as we uh, maybe close down. Let's take a look at some of those wonderful sponsors and we'll return to see what else we have in store.